Stanford University. Good afternoon. Welcome to E380 Spring 2009-2010. Um, I'm Andy Freeman. Computer science is not about computers. I think it's about computer scientists. And computer scientists, like all people, really, really like the one true way. <laughs> <laughs> and just to remind some of you of the one true ways you have believed in before, PL1. <laughs> OK. COBOL, whatever, whatever your one true way was. Unfortunately, the one true way depends upon our tools, our problems, and our beliefs about problem solving. And none of these things remain constant for very long. Today's speaker, Rob Pike, has probably produced more one true ways <laughs> than, than anybody else I can think of. And today's talk is about something that might become one of the next of them. Um, the problem I was having, by the way, that those of you who are live sort of got it before the video came on, is that uh, I want to say something about next week's talk because it's also a language talk. Um, it's from our friends at Facebook who decided to take advantage of the fact that you can execute dynamic programs written in dynamic languages using a lot of static techniques and surprise, get a factor of two to three. Yeehaw, it always works. And... Um, it will continue to work. But today's talk, Rob Pike about Go. Thank you. Thank you for what I think was a complimentary introduction. <laughs> um, uh, the first thing I want to say is uh, thank you for inviting me. It's actually uh, fun. This is the first talk I've given outside of Google headquarters about Go. So it's maybe a little rough in places. The most important thing I want to say is that this isn't just me. This is the work of a lot of people, um, and I'm very uh, happy to be working with such talented folks. So I don't want you to think, if I happen to say me or I, it's really us, and uh, it's not an individual effort in any way. Um, I'm going to go through a lot of history, because I think uh, Andy was right. There is one true way. I, I'm not claiming that's it today. In fact, I'm kind of complaining, uh, claiming the opposite. But there's history that guides where we are today, and I think a niche, which is a much smaller, a more polite way of saying one true way. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the language itself, and then sort of where we are. Let me start with a quote that I really like. Um, <clears throat> Dick Gabriel has a talk he gives with Guy Steele, and this is a, an excerpt from it. Um, he says, I'm always delighted by the light touch and stillness of early programming languages. Not much text. A lot gets done. Old programs read like quiet conversations between a well-spoken research worker and a well-studied mechanical colleague, not as a debate with a compiler. <laughs> Who'd have guessed sophistication brought such noise? Now, I think everybody knows what he's referring to there, uh, at least those of us uh, like me who've been around for those early languages. But let me just uh, illustrate a little bit. Here's some sophistication from the C++ OX standard. This is the language explaining how you decide which function to call when you see a function invocation. <laughs> And I won't read it, but I would like to point out that this, this is fundamental to what's going on inside C++. I'm not trying to make fun of it. I'm pointing out, it's, I'm calling it sophisticated. And I would like to point out, though, that it defers to partial ordering rules in the middle somewhere. So there's more sophistication elsewhere to sort this out. And this is kind of scary if you're trying to figure out from first principles what that language is trying to tell you. Uh, another way to think about it is if you're using C++ in the modern sort of style, you're probably going to use some one of the boost templated pointer types. And I looked the other day and I could find seven of them, <laughs> th two or three of which I had to look up to figure out what they were. So something's a little uh, too rich for my taste, I think. Um, as for noise, uh, this was a chat status I saw a couple weeks ago. I was actually snagged by uh, somebody I work with. Um, it's basically a, a confused function declaration ending with, dear God, please make it stop. <laughs> And then the bottom is a, a, a stylized, but by no means unrepresentative, declaration of a variable. And uh, the word foo appears seven times on that line. You could argue it maybe should only be there six. Um, but of course, in the original, foo was a longer word, and this took many lines. So this doesn't feel like uh, anything other than a debate with the compiler. And I think Dick Gabriel's quote is right on. 
So how do we get here? Um, I'm going to give a very personal and opinionated version of the story. And I, I, you know, I'm prepared to argue it with you, but this is my take. And I, in this particular moment, I'm speaking entirely for myself. I think what happened was that C and Unix became dominant in research through the 1980s. But some people didn't like programming in C, and they wanted a higher level language. And one of the things that happened was C++ grafted similar style object-oriented programming onto C, and uh, it kind of sort of worked. It took a while before it worked well, but it did eventually. <laughs> but the thing was, that made it possible for us to have higher level programming concepts available on Unix with tools that worked with the standard tools that were already there. It was a pure add-on, and that made it easy to get started. And so I think largely as a consequence, uh, C++ became the language of choice in many parts of industry and in a lot of research universities. <clears throat> but it was still, uh, it continued to grow and become more sophisticated and complicated. And not quite exactly what happened, but essentially Java eventually arose as a clearer, simpler, reduced form of C++ that was easier to, for people to understand. And by the late 1990s, a lot of universities were looking for teaching languages because they, they'd sort of moved on from C and, and some even from C++. We're trying to find something that students could absorb. And Java sort of fell out as the default, and it was not a bad choice for, for teaching. Um, but what happened was, through that sequence, programming became much more difficult than it used to be, at least in my opinion. I think these languages are, are hard to use in, in the most general case. They can do lots of stuff, they're very subtle, they're intricate, but they're verbose and they're difficult to write well. And there's a lot of extra stuff we tend to add on to make them nicer to use. And the obvious example, although there are others, is the notion of patterns. And I think patterns is a really interesting idea because uh, you can get a lot of sort of extra level of power and understanding by communicating in that common vocabulary. But as Peter Norvig points out, patterns are, you know, and this, not, this isn't a criticism as much as an observation, patterns are really a, a definition of a weakness in your language. In the old days, subroutine calls were a pattern. But now we don't think of them as patterns anymore because our languages can express them well. And his point is that a lot of these so-called patterns are going to be things that we just have in our languages and use. And we don't really think about them as anything worth writing books with multicolored ribbons anymore. Um, but nonetheless, uh, despite the, the need to sort of augment the environment in order to make things nice, these languages are very successful and they are vital and thriving. Um, but something happened. Um, because a lot of people had trouble or didn't really like working in them, there's been a resurgence in the last few years of languages and the success of languages, some of which have been designed quite a while ago. So um, a number of successful simpler languages like Python, Ruby, Lua, JavaScript, and so on, have become quite popular in the last few years. Um, and I think it's part because of people reacting to the difficulty of working in these, these sort of standard languages, as I call them. And there's also been a, a few very beautiful, but much more rigorous languages that have cropped up, like Scala and Haskell. And I think those are also very interesting examples because they're, they feel almost uh, a little bit like a reaction. Like, here's another way to think about programming. And those are quite beautiful, and some of those are also catching on. So despite the standard model, everyone graduating from university is basically a Java programmer, and many are not much else. Um, other approaches are very popular in the community, and there's kind of a growth of what I call outsider languages, programming languages designed by people who are not first and foremost language designers, but nonetheless are able to build successful languages that people can work. And I think uh, there's a reason for this. Um, and I think it's caused fundamentally by a confusion. The, the standard languages are statically typed. We all know that. Um, and most of these outsider languages are not. They're mostly interpreted and dynamically typed. And what's happened, I think partly, this isn't the whole story, but I think part of the story is that non-expert programmers have begun to confuse static typed and compiled languages with hard and dynamic and, and um, interpreted languages with easy. And the thing is, as you, you well know, those are really independent ideas. And something has gotten fixed in the mindset in a, in a way that's causing trouble. Um, and I think part of that is due to the, how we got here, that historical sequence of sort of grafting things together to get somewhere. And somebody needs to sort of rethink. So uh, obviously, we want to rethink. And I think there's a niche, because there's an observation in there that we can turn into something useful. So um, first of all, what's good about these languages? Well, they're very good languages. There's no question about it. I'm not here to, to, um, you know, to destroy them. Um, I don't think that's the point of anything. We're not trying to say they should go away. They're type safe. They're effective to work in. Lots of people build useful software in them very well. Um, they're very efficient, and in the hands of experts, you can do some amazing things with them. 
They're also fundamentally useful. There are huge systems and huge companies that are very successful that have built entirely on them. And so I don't expect they're going away. I wouldn't want them to go away. Um, that's not what, what this is about. Um, they're also extremely good for large-scale programming. And I don't think we understand why, but we know that's true. Right? There's this sort of belief. Bjarne Struess works in something called something like the Large-Scale Programming Research Group. And it's interesting that he thinks that. I think he's right, but I don't understand why. It's an interesting point. But these languages, I think, also have their bad aspects. They're hard to use for ordinary programmers. And I, I don't mean, you know, the people in this room. I mean the people who are coming out of school trying to, you know, work in, in the world at large or who don't work as programmers full time. Um, I do a lot of work with physicists, and they have trouble. Um, either are smart people, but these concepts are difficult to deal with. The compilers are very slow, typically, and they're also very fussy. You have to sort of debate with them, as Dick Gabriel says. The binaries tend to be big, and to do work well in them, it often helps a lot to have a lot of language-aware tools, IDEs, and rich environments. Um, and at work, uh, where I work at Google, we use distributed compilation farms because otherwise the compilations take too long for some of these programs. And so as a consequence, programmers who can try to avoid using them. They tend to work in these, these other languages that are more fun. Um, and they're also um, sort of independently, but very importantly, at least a decade old, depends how you count. Um, and they're not well adapted to the sort of standard large-scale programming environments that have come up in the last decade or so. They don't have fundamental support for concurrency, networking, multi-core CPUs, and so on. And so as a result, people go off to these other languages, which because they don't have much of this bad stuff. Um, they're dynamically typed, so you don't have to tell the compiler all about your types. Um, so you don't type as much, this kind of typing, as well as the other kind. Um, they're interpreted, so you don't have to wait for distributed compilation farms to construct your binary. And the tools tend to be better because interpreted languages are easier to build tools for. But of course, they don't have the good. They're slow, sometimes very slow. Um, they're not type safe, by which I mean in the simplest case that statically detectable errors in principle tend not to be caught, but instead happen at runtime. And uh, it's really annoying. Um, and also, uh, I think as an assertion, I will simply claim, I won't try to back it up, but I also claim these languages are very poor at scale. They don't, you can't, I can't imagine working on a million line, or let alone a 10 million line Python program. Um, and also, these languages don't have any of that modern stuff either. So in that respect, they're not helpful. So there's this niche, and, uh, and Go is really about that niche. There, there's room out there for a successful language that is comprehensible, that is, means easy to understand, statically typed, it's light on the page, it doesn't look like you're yelling at the compiler, um, it's fast to work in, scales well, it doesn't require tools, but we'd like it to support them well, because tools are great if you can get them to work, and also has some support for networking and multiprocessing. Now, that's a niche, and I, there are certainly languages out there that fit somewhere around here, but there doesn't seem to be on, on anybody's um, big picture radar at the moment. And so that's where we came in. Um, sitting in, in my office a couple of years ago, waiting for a compilation after coming back from a C++ OX talk, we started talking and we said, you know, we really got to do something about this. So we did something for us, and it may not be for everybody, but it works out pretty well for us. Now, I can't teach you the whole language in the time that's available, and you wouldn't want to listen to it. It's much easier to just go online. So I'm going to try to tell you more of the why, why the language is the way it is in respect to these sort of properties I'm looking for. Um, to do that, I have to show you bits of the language, so there's a bit of tension between what I show and what you have to take on faith. But let's just, I'm assuming that you can follow the examples even if I don't explain every nuance. So, but I'm going to then just give you a quick tour of language with an emphasis on why it's the way it is. So our target here, to summarize the sort of niche location we have, is to combine the safety and performance of a statically typed compiled language with the expressiveness and convenience of a dynamically typed interpreted language. Now, as I said, there are languages out there that do that, but the, in the environment I work, they're not getting any traction. So let's see if we can try again. Um, and this language also should be suitable for systems programming, and I'll define that a little later. And the reason is that's what we do for a living where I live. Uh, so here's a Go program. It's actually a complete web server. Uh, you can see it's got a package declaration, borrows some libraries that it imports. Uh, there's a handler that knows how to do some HTTP presentation. And then there's a main function that starts an HTTP listener and gets it going. That's a complete program. I'm not going to talk you through it all, but I want you to just get the idea that that's what it looks like. Vaguely C-like syntax, but it, it's obviously not C. There's some things about it that don't look too C-like in detail. So the question becomes, how does Go, go fill this niche? That's really what we're going to do. We're going to go through all these points and try to explain uh, why I think that's true. So let me see if I can drive this computer and give you a compilation demo. This is not for the benefit of the people in the room. This is for the people watching at home. 
Um, I've got a directory here that's the JSON marshler and unmarshler uh, package, which is a couple thousand lines of code. And if I make clean time to make, it takes uh, less than two tenths of a second. So that's a couple thousand lines of code. It's not breathtakingly fast. Uh, believe me, you can do better. But it's pretty good. Um, and when we first uh, announced Go internally, there was a guy in Sydney who thought it was pretty cool. And he used an editor with a funny name. I, I forget what it's called now, unfortunately. But it has the ability to write plug-in tooltips. And he wrote a tooltip program that you could hover over a Go program. It would compile, link it, and run it, and show you what this usage message was. And he proved that it did that faster than a Python interpreter could start. <laughs> and so let me, sh uh, today Russ uh, actually wrote a version of this. This is the same thing. So when I hover over one of these Go programs, it sends a request to the web server, which is running the same machine, compiles the program, links it, runs it, and throws it back on the page on the web. So it's like his little tooltip thing. But does compiling from scratch every time. Now, these are trivial programs, but that's not the point. The point is, this is what you think of a dynamic interpreted environment, not a compiled language, if you were someone who's only been working in the last decade. Okay? Yes? Why are you, why are you still compiling? I don't understand. That notion to me does not seem modern anymore. It seems like you could just as easily have built, why don't you just include the compiler in the runtime system and compile it on the fly? We plan to do that. That's compilation. how we're going to run a web page. Running, running in the, we can just run the compiler. It's light enough to do that. But the thing is, when you have a statically built binary, you can start it quickly and so on and so on and so on. That's two tenths is two tenths you don't have to spend if you have it already built. So obviously it's fast enough that that's something we're talking about, just not bothering with the compiler as a separate stage at all. Um, so why is this so fast, at least fast compared to GCC, which is an unfortunate reference point? Um, GCC is an amazing compiler, and we don't have nearly the technology they do, but they're also much more um, old and crufty. So we have this nice new clean compiler, and I think that alone is worth something in the neighborhood of 5x, maybe more, but let's be conservative. But we want to get something like a million x. I used to have builds that would take 45 minutes to construct my binary running on something like 100 machines in a distribution cluster. And I want to build those on one machine in a tiny amount of, of time. So uh, that's, that's a problem. But it's actually that, that huge blow up is mostly the dependency problem. When you build C++ binaries in particular, less so with Java, you tend to compile way more than you really need because the compilers don't manage it well. So in Go, we have a fairly strong idea of a package, which is just what you think it is. Um, but the, the key point here is the way the package dependency tree is, is worked. So if A depends on B depends on C, you have to compile them in reverse order. We require that, although we can obviously compute that dynamically. Um, and then, but the key point is when you go then to compile A, you've already done B and C. And the really important part is that in order to compile against B, if you don't explicitly need C, you don't have to think about C. Because all of the dependency information B needs from the downstream libraries has been pulled up into that guy. So if A imports B, you just look at B. And that doesn't sound like a big deal until you're talking about thousands and thousands of files and the reduction in the tree, the trimming that goes on. Um, so here's an example. Um, this, this is trivial. Large C++ programs, of which there are lots familiar to you, um, tend to take forever to build. So that's too hard to quantify. Let's take a simple case. If you have a C program and you include stud.io.h in, on this laptop, uh, it reads 360 lines from nine files. Okay? If it's C++ and you include iostream, which is roughly comparable, you get 25,000 lines into the compiler from 131 files. And if you're using Objective-C on the Apple, including Coco.h, 112,000 lines from 689 files, but you haven't started compiling your program yet. This is what just preamble. Right, well, you can do pre-compiled headers, you can do tricks, but there's a flaw in the, in the way that the header files are managing the dependencies. Okay? So the way we did in Go, where you just import this stuff and compile it, the way, essentially the way Java does, although maybe a little simpler, um, when you import a simple library, which is correspondent to standard I.O. called FUMP for formatted I.O. You read one file, the FUMP package file, and it has 195 lines inside it summarizing the six dependent packages. And if you multiply that up to scale exponentially, I think conceivably you could get a million X speed up in relative to the builds we're used to on these large binaries, and probably 100,000 is quite feasible. And that starts to become important. So there, you can debate the details of this, but I think there's a fundamental issue there that the C and C++ family of languages do not handle packages and dependencies properly. Um, so that's, that's how we uh, compile quickly. Um, expressive type system is this notion that the very type-heavy inheritance-driven model, which I sort of called the standard model before, 
Uh, it's not the only way to do things, and we've taken a different approach here. Go is an object-oriented language, although some people would, would define object-oriented in a certain way to make sure that you can't call Go object-oriented. But to me, it's object-oriented because it, there are objects and methods, and that's what it means. Um, but there's no such thing as a class. There's no subclassing. Um, inheritance is not the center of the world. And any types, even basic types, like integers and strings, can have methods. It's just like the old small talk days, except uh, in a different, uh, in a compiled world. And there's also a thing called interfaces, which are implicitly satisfied contracts between things that, that implement methods, and I'll, I'll talk about those in a second. So here's a little more Go code. Again, very simple stuff. Um, we can def if we have a name type, you have to get a name of your own before you can uh, put a method on it, because methods are package local, and you have to define the type in your package. So uh, if you have some type day, which is an integer, then you can define a method on days, like this string method that returns a string. Sorry for the stutter there. Um, but this just says how to print print the day in a nice format. And you can imagine that would be a little bit more complete, but you get the idea. The syntax there is there's a function keyword introducing the method. The first parenthesized thing is a declaration of the receiver for the method, the type, and giving it a name. Then there's a string method, which takes no arguments, and then the return type is string. Uh, you'll see later the return type can actually have more values in it, so it might be a parenthesized list of its own. But that's, that's a very simple method declaration. And then we can do the same thing for a floating type, Fahrenheit, which knows how to print itself as a nice percent %f. Um, and these are just values that have methods on them. Um, they're underneath, there's a pure int and a pure float. This is not the Java concept of integer. There is no boxing or unboxing going on. There are pure integer and pure float types, just like int and float. But you, they have methods, so they format nicely. Um, and you notice we made two things there. They both define this string method. We can actually create a thing called an interface to characterize the behavior of something that knows how to print itself with a string method. And we do that by declaring a thing called an interface, in this case, we declare a stringer interface that contains a single method uh, called string, no arguments, returns a string. And anything that implements that method with that signature is satisfied by that interface and can be used by, say, a function that wants that type as its argument. So here's a simple implementation of a printf-like thing that takes an arbitrary number of stringers and then just runs over that list and prints out a blank separated list of the things by calling the string method on, uh, oh, I screwed up, sorry. That's, that right string of that should have been s.string. Um, so, uh, well, sorry, uh, that should say s.string. Um, but anyway, the idea is that the stringer type captures that behavior, and so you can run print and write this thing out. And these methods don't take pointers. Uh, they can take pointers, but they don't. Um, and anything that did have a, a pointer method, a pointer received from the method, which is more typical of a class-like system, could also satisfy stringer if it had the, that kind of method. But what happens if I don't want to print a Fahrenheit or a day? What if I want to print just an int or a string? There's a concept of the int empty interface. And the empty interface is an interface with no methods in it. And everything satisfies the empty interface because there's nothing to satisfy. The, the nil, I guess you could reduce this to the axiom of choice, but we don't need to go there. Um, and so as a result, we can define a, a different, more useful print function that instead of taking a slice, uh, uh, sorry, an uh, arbitrary number of stringers takes an arbitrary number of interface empty types. And then running over them prints them out. But then there's this thing going on in the middle here, which is there's a type switch. And we, s we ask the question in that type switch, does the thing in my hand satisfy the stringer interface? That is to say, does it have that type? And if it does, then I can call the string method, which I got right this time. Um, if it's an integer or a string, you can print out different ways. And this is somewhat idealized, obviously, but this is essentially what the printf, type safe printf function in Go does. This is how we implement it by knowing how, to, how things can print things and can control their own printing by satisfying interfaces that the printing, printf program knows about. And so then with this modified print, I can print several things, including a, just a plain old string, which will be printed straight to the output by the case string in the type switch. So empty interfaces have a lot of, of power, but uh, I don't have time to go through them all. A more typical thing that happens is you get these little one-line things like stringer. Um, month and day, those types, oh, sorry, it was month and day, it was Fahrenheit and day, satisfy the stringer, interface implicitly. I never had to declare that they satisfied stringer. They just did. And they did because the methods that they implement are those defined by the stringer interface. And it's key here that the thing, uh, there's no implements declaration. It's all implicit. It's kind of a form of duct typing, but uh, not really because it's, uh, that usually means something more dynamic than this. This is actually usually, but not always, statically checkable. And that's really important for type safety. Although sometimes you do have to re resort to dynamic typing, but then the language forces you to be clear about your intention. Yes? So 
It seems that the implicit, that the purpose of implements is to describe semantic, not necessarily just a match in method signatures. Yeah, the implements thing, that there's, a, there's an implicit contract that we're sort of assuming you know how to do. The semantics have to be right. You're absolutely right. If, you don't, if, if your string guy you know, does something that isn't what printf expects, things will go wrong. It doesn't seem to be an issue. Convention seems to carry the day for that. But it's obviously a possible problem. But it hasn't, really hasn't come up. Um, the key point here is that most interfaces, when you write them in Go, are very small. One or two or three or even zero methods. And here's a, here's a very uh, common example. There's a type defined in the system called reader. And reader is, a, is an interface that contains the standard definition of a read method, which is the usual I.O. operation that reads um, into a, a, a storage location, uh, returns a pair that tells you how many, integer, how many bytes were read and if there are any errors. And there's an obviously complementary writer interface that I didn't put there, because, but you know what it says. And the key point is that anything that has a read method implements reader and therefore can be used to do I.O. when you want to read from something. Examples include the obvious things like files and buffers, network connections, de uh, decompressors, all kinds of pipes, uh, checksummers. You can chain these things together in interesting ways. So for instance, the JPEG decoder in the library doesn't take uh, a byte array or a file pointer or something like that to decrypt. It takes a reader and you just, it just reads from the reader object and it could be on different iterations of a loop. It could be a different un underlying object implementing that thing. And it's really important to, for the flexibility of the system that this happens. As another example, the buffered I.O. system uh, actually doesn't do any I.O. because it, the I.O. is abstracted away into a reader or a writer interface. So there's a new reader uh, function inside the buffer, buffer I.O. package that takes a reader as an argument, buffers it, and gives you another reader on output. So this line here where it says the buffered input reader is new reader of OS does sit in, that's how you buffer the standard input if you want to read it through a buffer instead of one read call at a time. Yes? This is cool, but this doesn't really strike me as a feature of the language. It seems like it's good, you know, good design of a library, right? Um, what it's a feature of the language. Let me keep going. The, okay. the stuff, I'm going to use it in a way that is not, um, the, the key point is on the next slide, actually. Um, as another example, fprintf takes a writer as its um, first argument as opposed to, say, a file. So anything that knows how to implement the write method can be written to with fprintf. And that, you saw that, actually, in the, in the web example I started with because he was actually doing fprintf to a HTTP connection, and that just worked. <coughs> the key point, though, is, is not that these are light or small or easy or implicit, although those are all important. The key point is that you can discover things post facto that make it easy to redesign or re-implement stuff without having to do major surgery in your type system. So here's a real example. A couple of weeks ago, um, we decided that we needed to have a JSON RPC uh, implementation. And we already had an RPC implementation, and we had a JSON, but we didn't have a JSON RPC. And we, and we looked at the RPC implementation, <coughs> and really all you need is a few methods for the RPC to be able to load stuff on and off the wire. And so we wrote an interface called encoding that put in the few methods um, that the existing encoding system used. And then we just made a tiny edit to the RPC package to change a, a concrete type that implemented the encoder into this interface type that had the same methods on it. So this red thing is, is really... That's the signature change to the thing inside the function. And then there's a little bit of renaming that went on, but it's, it's totally unimportant. This, this was the essence of the thing. And now we have an RPC that can handle any encoding type for the RPC transport. Right? We didn't have to touch the type system or in the RPC package or anything like that. Um, and so this gives you a kind of post facto abstraction. We noticed that the RPC system had only encode and decode methods. And so if we put those suitably named into an interface, We've abstracted the concept of the codec after the, after the package has already been written. And now we're done. We can use it. In fact, this whole thing took us about 20 minutes, including writing and testing the JSON implementation of this interface. So we had a JSON RPC adapted from an existing RPC in just a few minutes' work. Um, we also had to write a trivial uh, wrapper for the existing codec, but that's included in the 20 minutes, too. Now, you know, you can do this a lot of different ways. And the point here is not that this is something you could not do in other languages. The point is the simplicity and the sort of ad hoc abstraction that's going on, which I think is, is actually a feature of the language and quite different. The, in, our, in Java or C++, you'd probably take the RPC system, you'd refactor it probably with some tool, you'd make some half abstract class, I don't mean that uh, to be what it sounds like, um, and you'd probably have two subclasses of the RPC 
But then what would happen if you wanted to abstract some other feature of RPC? What do you do then? Because you'd have to find another way to jiggle the, the type hierarchy to make it work. Whereas with these interfaces, they sort of, they're just there, and it, it's common and typical for something to satisfy many interfaces simultaneously. And that makes it possible to discover things after the fact. Yep. Is the interface matching checked at compile time or runtime? It depends. Uh, if it has to be narrowed, it's a, it's a, a runtime check with, a, with an assertion in the code. But all, but all the static checking that can be done is done. Method arguments, for example, you can check it at compile time. Oh, yeah, almost always. Yeah, method arguments is a perfect example. So, but if you have to narrow it, in this case where that happens, you have to assert, I know what I'm doing, I know I'm narrowing the type. And that is check statically if it can and dynamically if, it's, if it can't be. Uh, if you go through it through the empty interface and out again, you can statically lose all your type information, but the dynamic system carries it along. There's, there's a lot more about interfaces than I said. You know, this is a tour. Um, okay, um, so that's the type system, at least part of it. Um, another really important point, which is this aspect of modern things, is we really want to be able to work well on distributed machines, multi-core machines across the network, and existing languages that are used. Um, there are counterexamples like Erlang, which is a beautiful one, but the systems languages we use don't tend to have linguistic support for the kind of operations that we want to do. So Go provides this concept of a Go routine, which is our, a, a made up word for a reason. It's not a process, it's not a thread, it's not a task, it's not a coroutine, it's different. Um, and so we gave it our own term. And then these, co these Go routines communicate and synchronize using things called channels. And for uh, some of you, this will be very familiar from other languages that have been around, but uh, in the context of Go, it's kind of interesting. For those who don't know about this stuff, um, it's very much like uh, a sort of vague type safe generalization of Unix pipelines, but uh, they're much, uh, much lighter weight in Go. So there's this co uh, Go routine launching keyword, Go, um, and you, to do a parallel computation, it's really easy. You write some function, inside that function, you say Go, this other function. And what that does is it launches a Go routine that's now a parallel invocation of that function running alongside yours. And then you can start another one while you're waiting. Um, and th so the, in this case, those two function invocations will run in parallel, or at least concurrently, which is a slightly different meaning. Um, so roughly speaking, a Go routine is like a thread, but it's much lighter weight. Um, it, it's really important that the language takes care of this. The stacks are small. It is routine to have tens or even hundreds of thousands of Go routines in your address space. Um, the stacks are segmented and sized on demand, so they can become arbitrarily big and shrink back and memory is recovered. You don't have to pre-declare the size of the stack. That's really important. Um, the Go routines are muxed by demand onto true threads. Essentially what happens is when a blocking operation is about to happen in a Go routine, it gets put onto a queue for some thread, and that means that all of the ready-to-run Go routines can, can communicate uh, without blocking. But when the blocking event completes, you can reschedule and make it all happen. It's not a, an original idea, but it's, it's, it's part of what makes this work. Um, and the key point here is that you really can't do this as a library. The features of Go routines are not the kind of things you can put in, say, a C++ library with any kind of ease. The stack management alone is, is something you really need pretty fundamental support for. But of course, this is a stupid program. You can't, you can't use it because you don't know when anything's done. So, um, but it is nonetheless a really good starting point for the idea of, of what we want to write as software in this world. There's a model uh, called thread per connection, which has been a big debate inside Google, whether it's a good idea to use a thread per connection. Um, if you have tens of thousands of connections, you run out of resources on a Linux kernel because you can't have that many threads. So it's clearly a bad idea, and so we construct these counterproposal continuations, asynchronous callback stuff, and it's just a spaghetti mess. Um, but in Go, you can do this pretty easily because of this muxing of the Go routines onto real threads. And so uh, this is an idealized but perfectly plausible uh, inner loop for server in Go, where you accept a connection, uh, set, set up your local properties for that connection, and then launch a Go routine to serve to the, the whatever it is that the client wants. And we do this quite routinely. But the problem is you still, in this model, don't know what's going on. Uh, no, there's no way for things to tell you when they need more work or are finished. And so there's this concept of a channel. So going back to our trivial program, it's exactly the same as the one before. Um, you need to know when the expensive computation is done so that uh, you can uh, leave the function knowing they both completed. But there's no way to do that as written. And Go has this thing called a channel, which is a typed synchronous communication mechanism that lets you express that relationship. 
And so go routines, the short form of this is they communicate using these channels. A channel is a built-in type in the language. It's very much like the second generation CSP channels, but it's, it's important, it's not the same as the original CSP. Channels are not processes, they are, uh, it's like the difference between a file descriptor and a file. It's an abstract entity that lets you communicate, and I can hand it off to somebody else and let them communicate with the thing. I don't have to hold on to the original. Um, so they're, they're a first class object in the language, and so here's a, this compute and send function actually returns a channel. And what it does is it creates a channel and then launches a function to uh, send its answer to the channel when it's done and then returns the channel back to the caller. So the main function here, we declare the channel to be the return value from compute and send. And so we've launched this thing off into the ether, it's doing its thing, but we have a handle where we can get the answer when it completes. So then we can call the other computation and now we wait for the answer to come back from the first one and now we can print them both out. It's pretty simple stuff, but it's, it's, it's surprisingly powerful to have this sort of capability level uh, communication handle that you can pass around. So here's an example of the way you would probably write it in something like C++, where you have some worker pool and you want to get work done on all the workers. You declare some structure describing the work, and then you have some set of workers with a mutex that manage the data, and you share this memory among all the workers and then debate over the mutex about who's doing what. Um, you don't do this in Go. There are mutexes in Go, but they're very rarely used. You just, you don't do this. You don't communicate by sharing memory. Instead, you share memory by communicating, essentially passing the capability along with the information to, to do that computation. You reverse this equation and use the channel's transmit operator to, to synchronize and communicate at the same time. And as a result, you typically don't need or want mutexes in Go programs. I won't say you never do, but you typically don't. Yes? What is the scope of channels? You scavenge dead uh, governments. Um, the scope of a channel is within the address space, but there's a library that lets you go outside the address space and turn them into network calls. And scavenging of dead go routines when they re when a go routine reaches the end of execution. No, when the, sca when the when channel, channel goes away. When the channel, the, there's a signal on the channel that says it's done. You there's a there's a way to tell that it's completed its transaction. You know, it's it's what you'd expect. Um, um, what was oh yeah, so. So here's the way you'd write that, uh, this kind of worker pool thing. We have the same structure and then a worker object that ranges over the input work, does some calculation and sends an answer to the output. And so that's the sort of daemon running in, in the background there. So in the main program, we construct an input and output channel for the workers. We start them all up, give them some input to do. And this is actually a multiplexer because the input channel is um, going to be muxed across all the guys. Whoever asks next for the next piece of work is going to get it. And then, uh, so you send lots of work off in the background and then hang around for the results, which will come back on the output channel as, the, as they complete. So there's no mutexes in here under the covers, of course, there's lots of synchronization. But linguistically, it doesn't feel like a, a mutexy thing at all. And th we have built lots of software like this, and it's a very successful model, even though it may not you know, have the, the s slickness of some of the fancier stuff, it's really easy to program in. Um, well, another thing you need to be able, be able to work quickly is garbage collection, and I don't think, uh, well, I'm preaching to the choir, I think, but let me go through it anyway. Um, automatic memory management just simplifies life. I don't want to think about which of seven boost pointer types I have to deal with to, to manage my memory. Um, but there's another point. If you're writing concurrent server software, it's more important than ever to have garbage collection because you don't know in this pool of stuff handing information around who's finally finished with the data. And having the garbage collector take care of it means not only is it sort of taken care of, but the interface design around those objects just becomes dramatically simpler. And as I said, I'm preaching to the choir, but it's, it's really, really important. And I, it's amazing to me how far C++ has gotten without, without having true garbage collection. But, you know, they have their story and it's very successful too. Um, but garbage collection isn't enough. You need more than that to make a system work well and be, be safe and, and so on. It's really important to have the safety of memory itself. And Go in, memory in Go is intrinsically safe. Um, I won't guarantee there's no possible way anything can go wrong, but compared to uh, C++ in particular, and I think even Java, it's got a pretty good story. Uh, we actually have pointers, ordinary pointers, but there's no pointer arithmetic. Pointers can point to the insides of objects, but you can't derive a fake, uh, uh, you know, an incorrect address um, in a correct program, in a, in a legal program. It will not compile. You can't write that code. Um, there are no dangling pointers because if you return an address of a local from a function, it gets moved to the heap. So that's, that's also very nice. 
Um, there are absolutely no pointer integer conversions in the language proper. There's a cheater library that's needed for some very low level stuff, but it's called unsafe and it's called unsafe for a reason. And if you're running in some secured environment, you simply outlaw that library. You wouldn't be allowed to use it. Um, and in that case, it is absolutely impossible to derive that kind of address. Um, also, everything that's created is zero initialized for some definition of zero appropriate for the type. So there's no such thing as an uninitialized variable. And because we know everything's zero initialized, we try to make types behave such that the zeroed thing is a useful thing. For instance, when you allocate a mutex, um, the zero of the mutex is, is an unlocked mutex. It's useful. You don't have to call some initializer. You can just use it, which means you can just declare it and it's ready to go. And there's obviously much more interesting examples like buffers and so on. And all indexing is bounds checked. And it was surprising to me when we got this stuff starting to work, that machines have moved so far since the last time we worried about this stuff that uh, bounds checked loops can actually run very, very fast in the modern world. It's pretty amazing. And as a result, I wouldn't guarantee there are no buffer overflow exploits possible in a Go program, but there's sure a hell of a lot fewer than in other languages. And I mentioned very early on, it's important that this thing be a systems language. And I have a pretty strong idea of what that means. Some people think that we meant it's an operating systems writing language. And honestly, we didn't really worry about that. Although it's possible that could happen. M what's more important to us is the kind of system software that we write at Google. Things like web servers and browsers and crawlers and stuff like that. Um, search indexers, you know, the usual sort of system software as we think of it. Um, programming tools, there's a lot of Go programming stuff itself written in Go and it's very good at that stuff. And that's what I mean by a systems language. But some people might say, well, the existing languages are good at this stuff. Why do you care? You mean, well, here's an example. Um, this is from a, a, a blog, uh, Go versus Java, that came out shortly after open source release. And somebody was observing that they had a Git program, the, the, the Git program, the actual source code repository manager, was written in C. And they tried to write it in, G in Java, but it simply was too slow because there were no unsigned types and they couldn't treat bytes as bytes. It, was, it just didn't, you couldn't allocate an array of bytes <coughs> as part of your object. You had to allocate a separate array of bytes and that slowed everything down and made it messy. And so it cost them a lot just to do very simple things that are fundamental to efficient systems programming. And of course in Go this doesn't come up. Uh, like C, Go has a full set of unsigned types. Um, it's got uh, bit level operations, all the ones you'd expect, plus a couple of extras just for fun. Um, and you have complete control of your memory layout. If you declare a structure and you put a buffer of 20 bytes in that structure, that, those 20 bytes are in that structure. And when you allocate one of those structures, those 20 bytes will be there and they'll be zero and you can just use them. And you can also take its address and pass that off to somebody. And that's okay too. But you, what you can't do is do something like P++ to move into the next one. That doesn't work. So um, you have all of the control you need for the most important stuff you need to do in a systems language, but you don't give up <coughs> safety in doing that. And that was, uh, this is an interesting little dance to work out. And then finally, and, and sort of most objectively, there's a part of this story that involves sort of simplicity and clarity. Um, there's things in Go that were deliberately made simpler than they might have to be, just to make sure that we understood what they meant. There are places in the language where we took stuff away because we wanted to make sure that someone could read the spec and understand what the language meant. And part of that is making things that are orthogonal to one another. There are methods and there are types. Methods and types are orthogonal, right? And it just sort of all works out. So an example of a few places where we actually made things harder in order to make them simpler, but I think worthwhile, is for instance, there's no implicit numeric conversions in Go. If you have a float and an int, you can't do an assignment. You have to say, I know what I'm doing. That float should be converted to an int. And that can be annoying but we have an ameliorating factor, which I'll show you on the next slide. There's also no method overloading. For a given type, there's only one method with that name and all of the type system lookup and the interface and so on depends on that name. Now there's, this, there's a signature associated with the method too and that has to match, but the key point is the name is what makes it unique. And so there's no method overloading. Remember that C++ OX slide I had earlier? All of that was about those two topics plus templates, which are not there either. Um, but in this case, in Go, if you have a function, what do you call? You call a function with that name. There's nothing to say. Uh, and that, that means that there's a whole bunch of complexity that isn't there by design. But in return for that, you, you have to pay the price in, in a few ways. For instance, you have to be explicit about your numeric conversions. Um, and there's also, uh, this is an interesting one, there's no public or private label like in, in C++ and Java for, for elements. Instead, we did something uh, very simple, but I, I think 
in retrospect, it was one of our best decisions, although it was very difficult to decide it was a good one when we first did it. And that is, if something is an uppercase object, then it's publicly visible outside the package. If it's lowercase, it's not. That's the, that is all you need to know about visibility. And it's pretty cool because although it seemed clunky and it means you cannot have an uppercase name that's local to you, you simply can't do that. It does mean that when you're reading code, if you see a name in its uppercase, you know it's a public name. You don't have to go find the declaration and look it up. And having worked in Go for a while now, when I go back and look at C++ code, I find it really frustrating that I'm reading code and I don't know what the client knows about and what I know all by myself. So it was a surprise how powerful that was. But there's definitely, a, in some sense, a loss of convenience because we're telling you what your names have to be like. But it's worth it. So I mentioned there's this no implicit numeric conversions, but we try to make life nicer. And the way we do that is we make constants really nice. So in Go, constants are ideal numbers. They're integers and they're floating point numbers. They don't have size. They have no signedness. I mean, they're signed numbers, but there's not an unsigned constant or a signed constant. They're just constants. And that means you don't have to put L and U. You don't get constants like ox full and stuff like that. Um, but they can also be arbitrarily big. So you can have huge numbers. And I'll show you on the next slide why that's actually worth having. Um, one shifted left 100 is a valid thing to have. And you can imagine in the middle of a constant calculation, you might get a value that big. And it's nice to know that it doesn't, you don't have to worry about it. Um, and then the syntax of a literal determines what its default type is. So if you say x is 100, then you're going to get an int unless you say otherwise. But that's because it says that's the syntax of, of an integer type. But the point is they're just numbers. And they, they don't have a, a fundamental type. So if I have a declaration like this where I say seconds is time.nanoseconds divided by 1e9, in C, this would give you a floating point number. But it doesn't in Go because that's just a number. And it happens to be representable as an integer. So this is OK. This division is an integer division. The result is assigned. And the result is an integer type, even though there's a floating point constant in the middle of it. And so that the divide method is in fact overloaded. The divide method is over for constants. Constants, but not for real values. Um, so, sorry? You can't put underscores in hex to, to space them out. No, that's, that's actually what the syntax of a hex is. Um, it's a surprising number of people ask for that. I never thought. Uh, do we have binary? No, we can print binary. That's a, you can have that. Um, now, these constants are high precision. Um, and of course, you have to be careful exactly what high precision means. So let's just say it's good enough. Um, <laughs> But yes, we try to do, you know, these, these are real big numbers. So this, this has properties. Like you can define a constant max u in that's one shift up 32 minus 1. And the compiler is not going to yell at you on some architectures because that doesn't fit in an int, right? Or um, if you have a, a, a number like the logarithm of 2, the very long, precise constant, all those bits are meaningful when we use it. So if we take, if we calculate 1 over that number, we get an accurate reciprocal to the, you know, comparable precision. We're not throwing away data by calculating in float 64 or whatever notation. We're doing a, an accurate division of that number. And it's only when we assign it to a, a, a variable or equivalent cell, like an array element, that has a physical type, that we then decide, OK, this has got to be rounded to fit inside the float 64. And that, those things all together make constants in Go one of the nicest things about it, because they just, they just sort of fall away and do what you want. It's, it's quite nice. Um, and there's more. There's, there's a lot of things. I can't go through the whole language. But I think you get the idea that we've tried to make it feel nice to use, express the kind of programs we want to express, go quickly, and so on and so on. And there's more to the story than even I have time for now. The package structure, which I talked a little bit about, is actually quite an interesting model. It works really well. Uh, and it guarantees that the dependencies that you compile are exactly the dependencies you need and no more. Um, there's, there's very clear rules about what initialization means and how a program begins execution. It's very well defined. Um, and you can write top-level initializing values and functions the way you're used to in an interpreted language, but not in a language like, say, C or C++. That's really nice. Um, we have composite values. Seems like a creature comfort, but it's actually huge. You can declare things of map type or array type as just constants or value, values with variables inside them and treat them just the way you would, again, in a in a non-C class language. Similarly, tag values for structs, you can identify them by number. C picked this up, but uh, we actually, it came out of the Plan 9 world that you could do that in C, so we'll take partial credit anyway. Uh, there are full function literals, full closures that close properly over shared variables when you invoke closure. Um, there's full runtime reflection for values and types, and so on, and so on, and so on. 
And then there's some really nice tools. We're still way behind in the tool category, but the ones we have are very nice. There's very good document, automatic document generation, automatic formatting, and, and stuff like that. Question? Yes? Is there eval? No. Question? No eval. And so, uh, in, in summary, uh, Go is, is it's just the same as all the other languages superficially, and I think there's nothing in it that's profoundly new. Uh, I think interfaces, when you dig around, they're pretty interesting, but I wouldn't claim they're totally unique. Um, I know they're unimplementable in JVM, which is interesting. Um, but when you dig deeper, it's actually a different world to work in. Um, it's an object-oriented language, but it's not type-oriented. You use methods that so you don't think about it as type hierarchy and driving things around. There is inheritance, I haven't talked about it. There is inheritance, but it's not the way you write programs. It's not the center of the thinking world when you're programming in Go. There are methods on any type, but no classes or subclasses, so that's different. Um, Go mostly is implicit. I didn't talk about all the implicitness, but although it's statically typed, types are inferred in an obvious way. It makes it very easy to use. It's fairly common to find you change a fundamental type in your program and you just change the declaration and the program is still compilable because the inferred types just flow through the program very nicely. Um, objects have these interfaces which are always derived, not specified. Some think that's a bug. We think it's a huge win. Big, big feature because of the opportunities it provides for discovering stuff after the fact. And Go is a concurrent language, but that's, that doesn't mean it's a parallel language. It is parallel, but the program model is concurrent, which is different. Um, a lot of people, when we first talked about Go in public, thought we were defining some parallel library language, and that's not really the intent. You can do parallelism in, with concurrent tools, and it works nicely, but it's not the kind of fine-grained Fortran stuff some people expect. What it does give you is a nice way to structure server software with lots of interacting agents that's very easy to understand and gives you a really pretty program structure. And you can, when you do that, just by accident, but isn't that nice, keep all those cores on those multi-core machines running along. And it, it turns out, although I didn't talk about this, a lot of programs just turn out to be very nicely written as concurrent programs, even if they're not fundamentally parallel. So that's kind of nice. So um, where are we now? Well, the language is designed. It's still being tweaked. I mean, it, I think these things never, never really finish. But it's very usable. It, we use it a lot um, ourselves for almost everything we do now. Um, there are two compiler suites, actually. Uh, for bootstrapping reasons, neither was written in Go, but I don't know that that will stay true forever. There's a compiler written in C. That, that's the one I showed you running before. Generates OK code, but it's quite quick. Um, it's got an unusual uh, design. Ken Thompson wrote it. It's based on the Plan 9 compiler suite. Um, it's, you can find out about it on the web. It's, it's not your standard compile assemble link kind of thing. It's a little different. But fundamentally, it's just a compiler. And then uh, Ian Taylor wrote GCC Go, which is a C++ front end for the GCC back end. It generates quite good code, but it's significantly slower because the GCC back end has, uh, you know, does a lot of amazing optimization. So you can think of these almost kind of the debugger and the production compilers, if you like, although neither of them is quite in that status, really. Um, the libraries, I think, are pretty good. Uh, they're growing quickly in a lot of interesting ways. Uh, it's very easy to write web server kind of stuff and editing tools and things like that. Some of the pieces are still pretty preliminary and some of the reasons really need to be added or fixed up, but there's enough there to write really interesting programs already. Um, there's a working garbage collector. It's a simple mark and sweep just to get us off the ground, um, but we've been worrying a lot about how to make that much better, um, trying to get the concurrency up. One of the things about multi-core machines, you can imagine concurrent garbage collection. Obviously, that's not easy. I'm not an expert on this, but we're working on it, um, and there are others around who are. Um, so the goal is to get the latency way down, the concurrency way up, so that you don't feel like you're paying the price for garbage collection. Uh, there's a Linux, Mac ports available, and Windows is underway, and it's all open source, so you can go get it, try it. Um, we launched around uh, the beginning of November last year, and two months later it was announced that Go was the language of the year by these people who I don't <laughs> know who they are, but that was very nice of them, and honestly I like being on that list, uh, especially at the top of it. Um, so that's quite <laughs> nice. Um, so here's a couple of testimonials. I just grubbed through the, the online site to see what other people think about it in sort of abstract. There's a lot of people saying, you haven't done you know, the language I would have designed, and yeah, that's right, we didn't design the language we designed, we designed the one we designed. But the people who use it seem to really like it, as opposed to the people who read the spec and, and ask questions. The people who actually use it understand what I was going through there about this trying to make a language that works for what you want to do. So here's a guy who took uh, a Scala program and he rewrote in Go. It ended up being about half of the main lines of code, 
and he makes the observation that it doesn't have this, this powerful Scala abbreviation stuff, but the type system in Go seems to outrun Scala when the program gets bigger. And I think that's, I like that. I don't, I can't prove that, but that's what he said. Um, and so as a result, Go tends to produce shorter code asymptotically. I hope that's true. I, I like to think that's, that's very true. That's misleading. That sounds if you wait infinitely long, it'll become short. That'd be cool, <laughs> wouldn't it? Uh, much shorter, not zero. Um, and then this one is the one I really like. Uh, he says, it does the things it does well. He says, it's the best match I've found when compared to C, C++, Erlang, Python, Ruby, C Sharp, D, Java, and Scala. And I don't know that I would go that far, but he said it. I didn't, so I'll just quote him. But it is, it, to me, it does feel like that. Uh, for those of us on the team, it's our main day-to-day -day language. We work in it mostly, except for the compiler work that's still going on. Pretty much everything we do is in Go. Uh, it's got rough spots, but much more in the libraries than the language. The language seems to be really robust, and we like it. The implementation seems solid. Uh, we're tweaking it in a in few ways, but it's pretty much settled on the, in the big picture now. Um, productivity seems much higher. Go was started during a conversation of waiting for a 45-minute build. Um, I don't have 45-minute builds anymore. As a result, I don't read nearly as much mail as I used to because I'll look up at the end of the day and realize I've been working programming all day. I haven't had time to go check my mail. And I think that's a good thing because um, I like to program and I don't really like to read my mail all that much. Um, has Ken built a uh, program for the game of Go yet? Ken has not done a Go program, but I think he's working on chess. Um, <laughs> Um, and inside Google, we're actually starting to use it for some production stuff. I can't talk about what it is, but you know, we're, we're finding it does what we want, which is why we did it, so that's pretty interesting. And I have to be honest, we haven't built any truly large software in Go yet, but I think the indicators are positive that uh, we may actually manage to make it work well at that scale. We tried to design it that way, but I can't claim we made it. So if you're interested, this is a true open source project. Uh, we're doing every, all our development in public. Um, we're Thrilled to have people contribute. Several of the ports to other operating systems, including the Windows port, have been done entirely in open source, and we're, we're happy, delighted with that. Uh, and so everything you need to know is uh, online. So if you're interested, please, I would go. Thank you. Questions? What is the license for the implementation? BSD. BSD license. Uh, with a patent non-assert, if I got the phrasing right. Right, that's the right phrase, yeah. Patent non-assert clause on a BSD license. And the GCC Go has a as a nice license, even though it's part of the GCC suite. It was a big political debate about that that I don't understand. I'm a programming person, not a lawyer person. But uh, GCC Go has also got a favorable license. What does patent not assert mean? Um, um, Russ, can you explain it? I can't really get it. It's just a clause at the end of the license that says, we won't sue you on the patents. Yeah. It means we'll be nice if patents come up in the. It's in a pretty region. common thing for. Uh, industrial companies today to add to the license so that they'll play nicely together. Yeah. Yes. I'm not a lawyer, but it, it makes the license nicer, I'm told. Yes? The experience of languages without overloading is that with increasing scale, whether it's lines of code or number of people working on it for years, that signatures tend to migrate into identifiers. So you wind up with food, boat, flu socket, um, foo payroll record, um, and a large class of identifiers that Sort of more spread like I'm making its problems with signatures. Right, I understand that. You reached the point where you've seen this effect. There's a few places where you see it, but I don't think it's as much of a problem because the package space forces you to qualify, and so it's not a global soup of names. So within one large package that may come up, it's come up a couple of times. A place like the reflection library, which is just a, a big bucket, it's kind of messy and it's unfortunate. But I still claim that I'm prepared to give up having method overloading in order to understand what happens when I call a function. Well, you certainly gained a great deal of simplicity. Witness your C++ example. Right. Uh, but, uh, I haven't seen it. We haven't built big enough software. I'd be interested to see what happens there. But so far, the package namespace gives you a lot of uh, simplification. Uh, you'll see in the documentation there's some nice examples about this the way that plays out. Package names are full, full qualification of all identifiers is required. Do you have anything equivalent to a using statement? Yeah, there is. A, you can. When you import a package, a package like func or buffio or whatever declares I am package func or buffio. But that's only the default name that a program, actually a file, will use for that package when it imports it. It can override it with its own name. So if I can import multiple things with, that call themselves Joe, but call you Joe number one, you Joe number two, Joe number three, and not have any ambiguity in my program. So there is no such thing as a package global namespace. It's my business to manage those names. And so you'll find, for instance, there's multiple programs already called hash. B 
because that's what they want to call their packages. But it's not confusing because you typically only use one of them. And if you use more, more than one, the compiler will say you've got an ambiguity. You have to choose what you're going to call them in your program. And that ambiguity is reported at use of the identifier or the, the import part. statement. The import statement in your program says I'm going to call this package hash number one, this package hash number two. Uh, so, so in fact, I can get errors even on things I'm not using. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, no, because you can't import something you don't use. But, uh, I'm not using. I'm not using the thing which collides. It's possible, yes, yes. But the name, the top level names have to be unique as you import. And to answer your first question, there is a using statement in effect. You can say, drop the package clause when I do this import. It's hardly ever used and we discourage it, but it's necessary for some of the testing tools. So we, we tend to discourage it. In larger scale, that, that management starts getting out of hand too. Okay, we'll see. I, I fully, uh, fully able to believe we're going to learn more than we know now. In the back. Uh, do you over check versus unchecked exceptions is irrelevant. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there was a big there was a big discussion about um, exceptions because when Go first came out, it didn't have them, and it still doesn't really. But uh, what we have instead is I don't want to get the details. I deliberately left it out. But um, we have a way for a program to control calamitous error in a clean way that's tied to function invocation rather than being a control structure. Let's just leave it at that. And so um, we think we have a really nice answer to that question, the way we present it. I don't like well, what happens in languages with exceptions where the program becomes about the exceptions instead of about what you're trying to do. And so I think we find a nice way to solve that. But I fully understand the need to control this, this Go routine died, but I don't want to die. Just box him up. And we can do that just fine. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's our answer. Uh, yeah, yes. Could you talk a bit about what you're buying by not having classes and subclassing? Can I talk about what I'm buying? Well, I didn't talk about the way inheritance works in Go. It's very different from um, having classes. What, um, I think the more interesting question is what you lose by having only classes. Because we have classes. They're called structs, and you put methods on them. And leaving inheritance aside for the moment, that's what a class is, right? So it's not that we don't, it's more like class isn't a keyword and subclass isn't a concept as opposed to not having class. And, uh, but it's, we use the fact that any type can have a method all the time. That print stuff I showed you was idealized, but that's how the print system works. It, it's, it's a type safe, but you know, general way of handling methods to print arbitrary objects. And if you have just classes, you, you have to do something different to get there and it's never as convenient or as nice. So I think you give up something there. The reason though, the reason we went away from it was we found that when you, when you write programs as inheritance heavy subclass systems, decisions you make early are very hard to change later. It's very hard to fix something like that RPC thing if you make the wrong decision. Or if you have another refactoring you want to do in the same code and they don't fit. So we just took a step back and said, let's make a type system that's really easy to understand but that doesn't have subclass type inheritance. Instead, we have three things. We have methods on any type, which I talked about. <coughs> we have interfaces, which give you a form of dynamic dispatch. Non-interface dispatch is always static, um, but interface dispatch is dynamic. And so that gives you, you can write things that feel like you know, subclassing with interfaces, and we do a lot of that sort of thing. And then the third thing, which I briefly mentioned, but didn't talk about all called embedding, which is a, a way to just drop something inside another object and say, bring the methods along and put it in here. But it's not like a mix in, it's, it's a, something more restricted. But we use uh, embedding all the time and it gives us a very simple way to understand and, and it's, it's almost like multiple inheritance with none of the type complexity. It's, it's quite neat. So you can, you can look it up on our, uh, on our okay, documents or we can talk it. That. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, you need that. Yes? Well, I'm trying to understand the concurrency model you're using. I have two other languages to, to ask you whether you know enough about them to, to comment how they're like it. One is Dean Tribble's Jewel. It has channels. Is this like that, or is it like Mark Miller's Ease Promises? Um, I'm sorry, I don't know either of those lines well enough to comment in detail. But what the channel stuff, I don't know who first came up with them. The original CSP, a channel was, didn't exist. You, you sent a message to a process, the original horror paper, right? You sent a message to a process. 
But the, and that was a, it was an amazing paper. There's a lot of brilliant ideas in it. But you couldn't write any real code with it because you never have started. You don't start with all your processes there. It's all, you want a much more dynamic system. And so I don't know where it came from. But sometime in the 80s, this idea of a channel came up. And a channel is, as I said, it's, it is to a, or to a process like delivery mechanism what a file descriptor is to a file. And so a channel is just um, a buffer. Re reifies the right. It, it reifies, reifies the capability of delivering data, right? And there's a, there's a send end and a receive end. Yeah. And in our type system, you can annotate. So if you want to say, I can only receive or I can only send, you can do that. But conceptually, it's one thing with two ends. And um, it's, by default, it is totally synchronous. So both the sender and the receiver have to arrive at their independent executing go routines in order to communicate. Uh, that's the default case. That's the synchronous case. Um, but you can, you can declare them as buffered as well, and then you can have asynchronous stuff. And you know, it depends what you're doing, whether you want asynchrony or synchrony. Um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, there's a lot of, there's more to it because of uh, how you implement multiplexing and listening from multiple <coughs> channels at once and stuff like that. I was just going to ask that. Can you, can, since it's a capability, can um, multiple threads or whatever, multiple locations have the output end of a channel and have something rational happen. Yes, you saw the example. The worker pool example did exactly that. All the workers were delivering to the same output channel. And it's rational. They'll be sequential in the order they arrive. It sounds like there's one person, one, one consumer. But in that example, there was one consumer. There could be multi, one channel in the middle with guys on both ends. In fact, the, as far as you can tell from the same example, that's how the input worked. Because there were multiple guys reading from multiple places. And I didn't say how the data was being delivered to them. Yeah. So it, it all, all that soup works. And then there's this control structure that's a little bit like a guarded command that lets you choose which of these guys can go. And there's discussions about how that goes. There's a very long conversation about it. I'm happy to talk about this. I can go on for hours. But maybe we should go to another question. You can find me afterwards. Yes. So thanks for giving this talk. I think it, it, it's clear that this is a beautiful and very well-designed language. Hmm. Um, I'm wondering Thank if you, very much. you said a lot up front about your motivation for the language. Um, but you didn't say too much about your process in designing it. And I know that Google, in, in other design senses, has been really a quantitative in the design approach. That's and interesting. That's interesting. Okay. Going along with that, then, how do you decide, at the end of the day, if Go is any good? OK, well, there's two questions there, and they're both very good ones. And they're both ones that I had in the talk and took out because the talk was too long. Um, <laughs> as far as designing it goes, um, it, was, it was the language, the project was created because we had an answer and we wanted to scratch it. And when we got a little bit into it, we realized, hey, this might actually be nice. We should probably pursue it. And uh, it started with Ken and Robert and myself at a whiteboard. I actually put, you know, I, had, I dropped it, unfortunately, but I had a slide with the original whiteboard. It's just, this is what we want. And it was just a list of desiderata. And it was amazing to me, in looking back at that, that we've, we've hit almost all of them. I mean, there's a couple we didn't get, but most of them are there. It's really sort of gratifying, because I'd completely forgotten about that original list. <coughs> But the key point about the design is that Robert, Ken, and myself, who started it, are three completely different kinds of programmers. We have very different goals, very different ideas about what's important, and nothing went into the language until all three of us thought it was the right thing to do. So it was driven by literally, you had to, everything was unanimous. And as a result, there's corners of the language that are peculiar because we said, OK, for whatever reason, we better do that. Um, but Robert had himself said at one point, you know, this is a way better language than it would have been if I designed it myself. You know, there's things that Ken put in or that, that I'd suggested that he wouldn't have done because he thought they were wrong. But once we talked about it and realized he thought they were good, and we ended up in a better place. So I think it's really interesting to have a very small team and force yourselves to agree. And I, other languages have been done that way. Um, but you've got to keep it a small group. And then later, people like Russ and, and Ian came in. But it's, we still have this very unanimous thing. If we have discussions, and there's a lot of discussions going on all the time, if it's not unanimous, nothing happens. It's not until we're all convinced this is the right idea. That is not the standard Google approach, um, because, because Google approaches about products, and this isn't a product in the same sense. We're trying to build the right thing. But I think it's an interesting lesson how we do things. And it comes from working with Ken at Bell Labs for many years. That's how we did it then. It's how we designed other systems. As far as success goes, I was actually talking to Russ on the when we were coming over. Uh, we don't know. And I don't honestly have a good idea how to say when it's successful. We don't know how quantifiably how well it's doing in the outside world. The one sort of interesting fact is those guys said we're language of the year, and that's very gratifying. But I think for our own internal use, there's two measures of success, one of which we can um, say is true, and the other we don't know yet. The one that's true is that we think it's a very successful language. We all feel much more productive 
in that language than in the other languages we've been working in for the last decade. Can the second know, thing, slide, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I was just going to get there. So there's our team is about I don't know eight or ten people, and and you know we're it's all we work on, and it's all we work in, and it's we love it. Right? It's really nice, but that's obviously totally subjective and stupid. The important thing is that we did this because we think Google has this problem. We think that Google's internal code base, like many companies, is big and growing, and the engine, large number of people working on it, and we think that the existing languages are close to the breaking point at some of these scales, writing these massive programs. And the real measure of success will be whether Go, when it steps into these larger systems, can deliver a usable, scalable, multi-person, multi-thing program. We don't know yet. We haven't gotten there. The, the programs that we're running in production now, they're in Go, are much smaller than that. So we can't really say. But I think that's what we did it for. We have to see. I'm pretty optimistic now, more optimistic than I was, say, a year ago, that this is going to work out. But we don't know yet. It's a long answer, but it's an honest one. Yes. Bro, is, this, is the language stable enough to actually use in production at this point? Uh, We're using it in production. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's several things. There's some internal stuff which I can't talk about. But golang.org, the website I mentioned here, that is a Go program, outward facing. It's a web server. It serves all kinds of interesting content, the documentation, the automatic generation of documents for packages, all the, it does all this, the dynamic annotations. So there's, the spec is all linked together by dynamic execution and stuff like that. And that's an outward facing Go program and has been since the day we launched. And, and you're not going to go through the same sort of gyration that the Java community did as they learned <laughs> how to make the language. As they learned what? As they learned how to make the language. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure there have been some pretty big ructions already, but it's settling. And uh, there's, a, there's a few open questions that we're struggling with, but I think the language is going to continue to evolve. We have a couple of things I mentioned that are very important. One of the most interesting is we have this program called GoFunt, which is essentially a pretty printer for Go. It doesn't sound interesting, but it's actually really important. A lot of the debates that go on in the programming languages user community is how you write certain expressions. And GoFunt tells you. It reads a program in and it writes it out. And it writes it out in the standard way. And you can disagree with it, but that doesn't help you because the check-in process requires that the output be item potent under GoFunt. But it gets better, because if we want to change the language, and there's a few cases where we have, we can tweak GoFunt to do several things. We can say, read the old code and write new code that with the syntax change or whatever. And we've done that several times, and it's an amazing tool. And then uh, Russ put this um, pattern matching language on the command line for GoFunt, so you can do really interesting tree rewriting while you're doing this. So you can pick the program up, change this expression, or modify this thing, and it's quite powerful, and write it out again. And that means not only that we can do that, but GoFunt is this public program. When we update the, the tools or do a release, we can say, run this script on your code, and you'll be up to date. And that's a pretty, pretty nice. So it, it's not everything, but it's a lot. That solves the forward compatibility problem to some extent. Yeah. That, that's, of course, the concern when you adopt a new language and invest a large amount of effort. Right. It makes us a little less timid to try to fix things we think are broken. In, in the back? Um, can you interoperate with other languages? Let's say you have a whole huge base of legacy C code or C++ code. Good. What, you what on earth could you be referring to? <laughs> um, there are two answers to that. There's a tool called CGO <coughs> that lets you construct bindings for C libraries. And that works fine. Uh, it's a little clunky, but it, it works. It's not as smooth as you and I say, but it's, it's good enough. And then we're very close to releasing SWIG for Go, which is the way that we expect that stuff will happen in the future for C++. What does SWIG for Go do? Um, it lets you... Uh, it, Swig is a, a tool that will read a C++ header file and write out stubs in other languages so you can interconnect. So if you want your Python program to call code in C++, you use Swig to generate the Python stubs. You write whatever you need to write by filling in those stubs, and then you can talk to the C++ code. So Go is becoming a language in Swig. It hasn't happened yet, but I don't even think the Swig guys know the code's on their way to them, but it is. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. There. You mentioned there were two uh, Go compilers that were in common usage. Are there compiler tests which make sure they behave the same or similar enough? Right. There are two compilers. Uh, we tried very hard to keep them in sync. There's a fairly large regression suite. We run and update regularly. Um, we occasionally find differences. We actually found one yesterday, uh, which is kind of interesting. But we try very hard to keep them in sync. There's also a third thing. <coughs> it's not a compiler. But there's a program, there's a, a package written in Go that is a full Go parser, fully compliant. Go is, uh, I didn't mention this, but it is designed so that you can parse it without a symbol table. It's entirely regular that way. 
And that means that you can, uh, it's very easy to write tools based on that package for doing interesting things with the language. And so there's an interpreter for Go, written in Go, that does this, although it's pretty rudimentary. It'll get better and it's going to probably be part of the debugger once that gets richer. Um, so we actually have three implementations and we try to keep all of those in sync and we have tested to verify <coughs> that that's true. So for instance, the parser tree, the parser suite package for Go check, runs it over the whole tree to make sure it understands everything. And then there's these regression tests on the two of them. We're, we're really sensitive to that issue. Try to keep them the same. Also, there's things that we wrote in the language. We try to make as clear as possible what a compiler is required to do and not do because we don't like the way there's all this interpretation in C and C++ that leads to incompatibility. We tried to legislate as much of that away as we could without making things too hard. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>